don't know about you, but music has definitely played a major part in my life. Now, I recently spoke to Emmy Award winning musician Barry Goldstein about music. And it's not only important in our lives, but actually essential as a healing tool. Barry, thank you so much for meeting with me and uh, being part of this. I'd like to actually ask you to introduce yourself to some of the viewers. So who is Barry Goldstein? Well, Barry Goldstein is a musician, a producer, um, a teacher. I've kind of like moved in between a lot of different worlds, you know, from being a, a professional music producer uh, as an, an artist and also someone who has um, really connected to the healing aspects of music. So I, a while back, I had a hard time defining my title because I didn't really feel like I was necessarily a sound healer. I didn't feel like I was like a music producer, just, you know, so I came up with the term musitarian. Um, <laughs> I love that. And it kind of combines things, but I, I define it as someone who dedicates their lives to the transformational aspects of music, how music can be used beyond art and entertainment. And that's really the big message. How can we bridge this uh, beyond the choir and into more mainstream where, where everybody can appreciate how music can be used um, in, in a healing capacity? So there must have been a point that you, in your life, where you thought, I've really got to help heal people. So what was the story that led you? What's your story that led you to this point? Well, it initially was a even bigger question of how can I heal myself, you know, and I think that's how most success stories start in, you know, in our world, yeah, you definitely. know, right. We're called to it because we're, we're utilizing it in some capacity ourselves. So for me, you know, I was like a type A New York city record producer and, you know, I, I kind of, fell off the path of, of music being something that I love because I was so immersed that it became a job. You know, I was, it was taking 100 to 200 hours of studio hours, you know, to create a four minute song. And it was on timelines and deadlines. And, you know, as a kid, that's all I wanted. And then all of a sudden it was there, you know, and it became a job like anything else. So. I remember a crucial and pivoting point where I was like, wow, this is not fun anymore. And I typed in music and healing on the internet at that time. And I remember pulling up a fascinating article that, that showed that music at about 60 beats per minute can target our heart moving back to a relaxed state. Wow. And yeah, and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. What if I set my metronome to 60 beats per minute? And I just began to take these hour long journeys instead of composing music and being on deadlines. It's like what would happen if I just let the music flow through me again? And I didn't think anyone was gonna listen to it, Lisa. I mean, they were like, you know, like hour long pieces of music. There was not a lot of melody in it, you know, but within these passages that later became my series Ambiology, you know, I, um, I began to move to a meditative state while I was composing and began to connect to a much more expansive field. I didn't even know like the terminology I'm using there, but I knew that something was going on and I was relaxing in the process and moving through my own anxiety, my own stresses, and actually came up with a new way of creating music. And when I played it back for people and they listened to it, um, they said, wow, this is, really, this is really relaxing. You have to put this out there for people. And so I did, you know, I reluctantly, you know, began to share this in the world. And we started getting testimonials of, you know, people using um, these ambiology series in like dental offices, mm -hmm. in hospitals, before people were going into operating rooms, doctors who were using them, you know, in 
the operating room um, to deliver children into the world, people using them in, in hospice. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating how this is rippling out, which created more of a curiosity of why, you know, it, it yeah. rippled out. And that's when I really wanted to, you know, delve more into the research. And when I wrote my book, you know, let's find out why and the mechanisms of why music is healing so that we can share it on a broader scale. You know, this is interesting. And by the way, I actually use one, one of those meditations called home all the time in my class. Nice. Um, because I feel that it, it creates this beautiful relaxed state without fear because in my world i'm a musician and you and i have had these many conversations mm -hmm. that some music can trigger you and certainly in meditations if you've got a babbling brook if you've got these you know thunderstorms going on you don't <laughs> know what you're going to be triggering with with anyone that's but right the beauty about the work that you have done what i have found is that I knew it was safe. I knew there was not going to be any of these things going on and that I knew my students would feel safe in that place because Imagine. music triggers us. Yeah. It gives us this trigger. And I feel that it's really important that, and I'm going to ask you this, what, what's your opinion on people's playlists you know they have playlists and i always so my son uh, charlie was very depressed and then i started to listen to his playlist and i'm like huh it was really dark it was really heavy it was and i started to wonder what if he started to listen to lindsey sterling or some of the more upbeat um and you know, we, we did an experiment and he was absolutely, and he turned a corner. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I think the, the, the important part of playlist for me is utilizing music as a bridge. So and Edgar Casey talked a lot about music mm -hmm. as a bridge. I like to ask myself, where am I now emotionally, right? Where am I now in my emotions and my mental state? What state of being am I in? Yep. before I listen to a playlist and then say, okay, where do I want to go by listening to music? And then what piece of music will take me there? So like in a case of your son, you know, if, if, um, if he was in a state where he, you know, wanted to calm down or, you know, was over exhilarated, that playlist might be great for him. But if he's in a state where he's all, you know, in a lower vibrational state where he may be depressed, you know, listening to more of that is not going to take him to that next place. So, you know, if even no matter what age you are, if you just ask yourself those simple questions, where am I now? Where do I want to go? And what piece of music will take you there? Then we stop depending on someone else to define our, our musical experience, because most of us have what I call random musical experiences. You know, we've all had experiences where music are powerful, but it's usually random. Like we hear a song in the radio, we hear a song by a friend, we're passing by someplace. But if we take it to the next level and what I call becoming the DJ of our own lives, and I think your son would probably like that term, yeah. you know, because um, younger people really relate to that fact that they don't want to be controlled mm -hmm. and they want to steer their own vessel. And they also like DJs. So, you know, when we can become the DJs of our own life, we guide our energy where we want. So instead of just having a random playlist with songs that we like or we, you know, we think we like, what would happen if we categorize our playlist by specific emotions? You know, so we create a playlist for gratitude, you know, and when we want to move to a more thankful state, then we have you know, a bunch of songs that bring us there. And it doesn't have to be like new agey, you know, instrumental music. You know, I'm a, like a kid of the 70s and the 80s. So like my thankful music playlist is Sly and the Family Stone, Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself, yep. right? Dido, Thank You, 
um, you know, put in a little bit of Karen Drucker, thank you for this day spirit. Right. And now I have like three songs that when I tend to sort of, you know, get down on myself or I'm not speaking kindly to myself or I'm taking things for granted, I can put on three songs and in 15 minutes, you know, I move to a more expansive state. So I think it's really playlists are great, but now it's about taking it to the next level. How can we really get specific and move to the emotions that we want? Because ultimately, we want to be in that place where our hearts are more open and we're speaking and having a conversation with our hearts because within our hearts are our purpose and our gift and our own unique vibration, all the great stuff that we want to share with the world. But if we're having another conversation, you know, that's a mental conversation and just, you know, being triggered by our, our stuff, we're never going to get there. And that's where really where music comes in. And I, I, what you were saying has taken me into some of the reviews that I hear and I read from various different artists where their fans, their listeners have said, your music has changed my life. And I feel that music can really change someone's life. It can talk them off the brink of a bad experience. It can move them into love it can change so many different dynamics. And so what are the, what are, I guess, what would you recommend for someone who is really trying to move through and really heal with their life and trying to get the best possible experience they can with life? What would be your, what would be your, I guess, tip or your thoughts, your ideas to help them do that with regards to music? Because it's so powerful. Yeah. That's a great question. So I have two thoughts with that. And one is going to be a, sh a very shorter version and one's going to be a little bit extended. So it's, it all really gears up, upon creating a musical program. So something that you're tapping into on a daily basis mm -hmm. and like anything else, you know, like a nutritional program or a meditation program, nothing creates transformation. And that's what we're really talking about. We're not just talking about a one-time thing. Yeah. We're talking about transformation of life into right. your, where you're living your passion. You know, nothing does that without creating a program and a consistency. So the first thing I'd say is identify one song. So no one can say that they can't identify one song that takes them to a better state than they're in. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember once distinctly, Lisa, I was at a, um, at a conference and someone asked me the, the same question. They said, I'm in a, you know, I'm in a state of anxiety and I have these anxiety t attacks, you know, and can you prescribe like w one thing that would change my life? And I said, well, I am sure that you have what I call a musical pinnacle or a happy song. Yeah. Like what is the one song that when you listen to it, it takes you from, state A to state B and puts you in a better state. And right in front of me, I saw her go inward. She closed her eyes and she thought about it. And I said, okay. And I saw a smile kind of come upon her face. And I said, great. It, it looks like you've identified it. Just hear it in your head. You know, you don't even have to play it. Just listen to it in your head. And she was, and I saw her moving like into this deeper state where her energy was shifting and she did it for about a minute or so and then she opened her eyes and she said wow that's amazing so of course I was like really curious like what song was it and she said it was green sleeves wow and she said I to this day you know as a child when I listened to that song it brought me to this peaceful state I don't know what it was about it and what was amazing was that I didn't even have to play it I can just hear it in my head and what she didn't know is that there are actually studies that show that even thinking about music can change our brainwaves and can change our states of being. So what she did was identify that song. You know, for me, my happy song or my musical pinnacle, I call this kind of the same thing, is Could It Be I'm Falling in Love by The Spinners. Right. You know, so like, what's your, what's your happy song? Do you know what yours is? Yeah, you know, I was just thinking about that. So um, 
I play it a lot, Can't Stop This Feeling, or whatever it is, by Justin Timberlake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really upbeat, and it's, my husband hates it, but I love it. You know, it kind of <laughs> gets me vibing. It's great. Yeah, so my wife's happy song, which I don't necessarily love either, is Kung Fu Fighting. <laughs> what so, funny is that? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the great thing is, you know, I did this on a retreat when, um, when I had like 30 people in a room. I asked everyone to play that one song, you know, and people just were so proud of their one song. And what I noticed was that when people played their song, other people were like were writing down, you know, the other people's songs. Yeah. So that's a, like a great thing to do, get 10 people in a room and ask everyone what their happy song or musical pinnacle is. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have new music to use as well for it. But this is, you know, this is the start of a musical program because if you can at least identify that one song, you know, it could be that, you know, that, that rope that someone throws to you when you're in crisis that pulls you out. If you can know that one song. So I can say now this, that the B part of this is then taking that one song and, and utilizing it one time during your day you know, to either uh, to motivate you or inspire you. And then, you know, create three other times in your day where you're utilizing music. Mm. So a, a song to start your day, and that could be your happy song, or mm. maybe you woke up with a lot of, you know, anxiety and you want to listen to a more relaxing piece of music, like you, like home, you know, mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and then, you know, you have a, a start of your day where you're creating intention with music. What's your intention for the day? Mm -hmm. And what song will really create a roadmap for that? So ask yourself where I am, where do I want to go? What piece of music will take me there? And then the next part of your day would be at lunchtime. So if you think of it like musical nutrition, you know, the first song of your day, it's like breakfast. You know, you're breaking the fast of your ears listening to something. Yeah. Right. Because you're in dream state for, you know, eight hours. What song will really, you know, break that fast? And then at lunchtime, what's going to renew or revitalize your energy? Just like, you know, by lunchtime, sometimes we're running out of energy. So we re-nourish ourselves and bring, you know, in food to that's going to nourish us. The same thing with music. So like I'm in front of a computer a lot, like in this room, I'm composing. Um, and I like to get away from behind my desk and get up and move during lunch. And yeah. something with a lot of rhythm or what I call a five minute vacation. So like I listen to a piece of music from a different part of the world to get me out of this environment. You know, not that it's a negative environment, no. but just like, you know, listening to uh, music from Jamaica you know, some reggae or listening to some oriental music, you know, and I feel like, wow, I'm, I'm going someplace else when I close my eyes. And then I, when I come back, I feel refreshed. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening, I think of that like as dessert, you know, like what piece of music will be sweet and nurturing to me and help me process my day so that you know, I can kind of review my day with this piece of music. Like, what were my challenges, right? And you do. You want that safety when you're going through your day and, and, you know, you're processing your day. Most of us don't even do that anymore. You know, um, we go through a we, we're high energy, like 24-7. We're going from social networks to TV, and then we think we're going to get sleep. But if you take a piece of music and process your day, what are my my biggest challenges would have been my biggest gifts, then we move through mind chatter before we go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I suggest listening to a piece of music at like 60 beats per minute. Home, the one that you like to listen yeah. to is 60 beats per minute. Um, a lot of my meditation music is so that it brings you back into a relaxed state um, and slows the brain waves down as well before you go to sleep. So you're not just trying to go to your busy mind, which is your beta, to your, you know, slow mind and sleep mind, which is delta. You know, you have something to bridge that from beta to, you know, alpha to theta. And it's a smoother transition. So you stay asleep longer. So that's the three really keys is 
um, three times a day to utilize music and incorporate a musical program. And if you do that, you know, like any other program for 30 days or more, you're going to see how powerful, you know, music is and beyond art and entertainment, but to really transform your life and focus you mm-hmm. on what you're here to share in the world. So you're not spending all your energy in drama, you know, and sweeping up situations that take so much energy. You don't have time for writing that book or that new piece of music or that new show that you want to launch and music really helps you to conserve and target your energy. You know, it's, it fascinates me how, you know, knowing that you were this high profile music exec in New York and here you are now talking the spiritual side of music because there are so many different facets. When we look at the different facets of music and I look at my own personal journey, I've gone from, you know, from again, the eighties pop, then into musical theater, then into my dance sort of zone and then sort of (laughs) transitioned. And I I look back at my, my music and it's so eclectic. And I think that I'm the only one with an eclectic palette, but no, actually we all are. We all have this total array of music. And I think that's such a great experience because you can create that, that journey. You can create that journey with your own music and your own taste. So what I want to talk about here is I want to really want to sort of kind of pick your brain on various different things that a lot of people have spoken to me about over, over the last 18 months, really trying to find the definition of what different people believe uh, about, you know, spirituality and things like this. So um, this is your way of being just truthful in okay. what you feel. So what do you feel, what is energy to you? What do you define energy as? Well, energy for me, I define energy as nourishment. You know, it's something that feeds my body. So it could, it could be positive or negative, you know, just like, um, just like food, when you nourish yourself with things that you're, that feel good in your body, you know, your energy feels more expansive and you nourish your physical, your mental, emotional, and spiritual. But if you're eating foods that you're allergic to, and maybe you don't know, right? Or, you know, foods that you do know are not good for you, but you're putting them in your body, you know, then it doesn't nourish you. And I think it's the same thing with energy. You know, the big question with energy I always ask myself is in, in situations in life and challenges. So people, places, situations, um, relationships, challenges, when I'm in them, I ask myself, does this energy feel like it's expansive or does it feel like it's contracting? And if it feels expansive, then, then I know that it's something that feeds my soul. Right. If it's something that's contracting and I'm feeling like I'm closed down from it, then I know that it's not good for me. You know? And granted, you know, sometimes there, you have to move through both. Like sometimes you have to move energy and it's not always harmony, you know, you have to use dissonance to move it and you move through things with people, you know, and something that was a challenging in a relationship, you can, you know, you could transform that dissonance where it feels contracting and you're both expressing yourself and hearing each other. And all of a sudden you've had a healing because you've opened up that energy and allowed the dissonance to move through and, you know, allow the harmony in. But I always say if someone is bringing that contractive energy into your field and it's a constant, you know, that when you get on the phone with that person, you feel like afterwards that you need to take a shower or, Mm -hmm. you know, you you don't have any energy left, then you have to start thinking about energetic management and how you want to spend your energy and how you want to set boundaries and not spend all your energy you know, giving that energy away to that one person. So energy for me is something that has, is a a state of awareness that you have to be connected to. 
so you can know how you're spending it. You know, just like money, you have a certain amount of energy that you could spend. Yeah. And you have to look at how you're spending your energy on a daily basis and how you're con conserving it so you can have more of it for your vision and your purpose in your own life. That's actually a great, a great way of thinking about it, how, you know, it's money. It's like your, your exchange. It's the way that you're paying. That's right. So it's something what you just said triggered me because going through my own painful experiences in life because we all have our own moments of pain i remember when there were things that were coming into my head random moments which i didn't want to think about i actually sang my way through it mm. and so when i was when when this moment would pop up i didn't want to experience or i didn't want to think about i started to sing the song i can only imagine and I found that I was singing very, I guess, spiritual or faith-like songs with faith, giving me faith. Um, and I was found that what I did is I pivoted my way of thinking through music and just by singing those songs. And it was, and by the time I finished the first verse, I, you know, I, the, the thought had gone, but it was quite powerful. It just made me think about that. That is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I Part of that is, you know, also is because most of us, when we're in situations that feel negative, a lot of times it's because we're feeling that we're not being heard mm -hmm. or we're not being appreciated or we're not being acknowledged, you know, yeah. and that is all, where is that? You know, it's all in this energy center or chakra, you know, it's in the throat chakra of yeah. not being heard, acknowledged or appreciated. Mm -hmm. So singing is such a great way to move through that because when we're singing, we're voicing, Yeah. you know, and especially that you're connected to these songs and beautiful songs of faith and whatever else. So you're opening up that center and, you know, that is also, you know, it's in between our, you know, crown and third eye. So when that throat is blocked, we're not able to integrate the energy of our spiritual you know, our spiritual connection, right? Yeah. And our intuitive state, right? We're not able to bring that fully into our heart. So for me, when you open that throat, then all of a sudden that energy comes through. And now you're, you know, you're listening to your intuition and guidance, right? You're connecting um, with releasing that energy mm -hmm. of control, right? Because when we are connecting up here, we're asking for assistance. Yeah. And um, chanting, singing, mantras, you know, anything that allows you to voice when you feel you're not being heard are, are an excellent form of using music or sound of vibration to open up the conversation. I love and it. To release energy. Yeah. yeah, I love it. So what's your definition of spirituality? Spirituality for me is connecting with something beyond myself. Right. You know, it has nothing to do with organized religion. You know, although I have felt very spiritually connected at times in different churches and mosques and synagogues, like it doesn't have to be based on the religion I was brought up in. But for me, it's connecting to something beyond myself. So either I think of it as the unified field that's beyond me, you know, like being on, on a top of a mountain and yeah. having my arms wide open underneath a beautiful night sky. You know, I'm connecting to something beyond myself or taking a walk in nature, you know, wherever I can see um, the energy of creation is always a really strong spiritual connection for me because I think creativity is you know, when we see all the creations that God's created, and I say God in the sense of a spiritual connection, you know, that we are able to see what's possible for us. Mm -hmm. So spirituality for me is connecting with the divine and whatever, however you define that, but not just connecting, inviting the divine in yeah. to my life with me. So I, you know, a uh, while back when I was exploring and you were talking about the many different aspects of your music and how it's evolved, you know, for me, when I was going through this, 
my path opening up, you know, I had a, a very defined sense of what spirituality was within my music. Mm. Like I had my pop music right here and I had my this music here and then I had my spiritual music here. And what I realized was when I tore down the wall of what that looked like and deemed all of it to be spiritual. Right. And said, no, all of my music is spiritual because my spirit's going into it. Wow. And if I can invite God in to every aspect of my music and ask him, her, it to create with me and it not just being my own creation, but a divine collaboration in all of those you know, then how would my music expand through that? So mm. it's, it's not just a matter of spirituality being a connection, but also an invitation to invite that spirituality in to create with you. And when you do that, you, all your fears and your doubts, like they go away because it's like, well, hey, you know, you can create like with Bono or The Edge or, right, uh, that's great. But when you invite God to create with you, it's like you can never be creatively blocked because you're always in co-creation. And it's just this amazing, it always unfolds to an amazing process, even if it's not always, you know, um, challenge free, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it always unfolds perfectly when you invite that spirituality in with you to create. You know, it, I, I've, um, I, I have a lot of background in the music, but I, I've spoke with many, many artists and they all say, I just wake up with this song and I can write a song in five minutes. And it's, it's like God gave it to me mm -hmm. or whatever. And I'm, and I knew, and they knew that this was going to change people's lives. And it did. And I remember mm -hmm. standing on the top of a hill with Diane Warren, who, and she had wow. written the song, I am here that Beyonce rang, uh, sang. And she was in this, Beyonce was in the studio at the time as I'm standing there with Diane. And she said, I don't know. She wants to change it. I'm not sure. And I went, let her do her thing because she's just going to feel it. And it's one of my, again, another powerful song. It's like, uh, there's a reason for us all to be here. What am I leaving on this earth? So it's quite amazing. Really. Yeah. Is. Songs as a vehicle, you know, is, so, oh. is one of the biggest things that really, we don't talk about that much in the sound healing community. You know, that mo a lot of people, you know, we're using a lot of great tools, you know, we're using bowls and we're using chanting. Yeah. You know, we're using flutes and, you know, all these instruments and modalities. But I think song in itself is such a powerful vehicle for sound healing yeah. that can happen, you know, in a, you know, three or four minutes, you're transformed. Like, it's like reading a book and having an aha moment. That's but right. a song, you can do it in three minutes. So I think this is part of a conversation that needs to be deeper within our community. You know, people think it's a, um, a panacea or a prescription that is going to heal, you know, something when, when we talk about sound healing or we talk about healing in general. But we're finding more and more that it's that preferred music, yeah. you know, that you love that is creating transformation, you know, in Alzheimer's patients now we're seeing it, mm -hmm. you know, when they're awakening their memories by listening to what their favorite songs were, you know, they call these autobiographical memories mm -hmm. that are, you know, creates neuroplasticity. So regular language doesn't have a pathway to evoke those emotions, but music does, Yeah. you know, and in Parkinson's patients, you know, they're seeing that music, with their rhythms, you know, that they love uh, are enabling them to get their, their rhythms more in alignment, their gait, you know. So songs have a powerful role mm -hmm. in our healing process. And it's something that we know. And it's something that, you know, we, we have to also bridge to our youth, you know, yeah. because they don't always get like, like chanting ohm, you know, or, you know, listening to this frequency is going to help them. You know, 
they have to have a bridge that kind of allows them to have an experience. That's right. And then once they have that experience, then they become open to it. Yeah. But like you said, with, like with let, let Beyonce do what she wants with it because she has to have her own experience with the song first. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and great. allow it to move. You have to have your own experience. And yes. because otherwise, and it's what singers are like, they, they have to feel the music. You have to feel the music. I remember when you and I were working and I was singing one of your songs. Yes, and yes. you actually said to me, you said, Lisa, take it as yours. Take it as yours and sing it as you. And yes. I was trying to replicate Barry Goldstein, but I needed to have the passion and sing it in my way. And it was, it was great. We had a great time doing it, but it was it, it, just those things by being given, I guess, the permission, you can then, you then have the passion to do it, which takes me to something else. What's your definition? Obviously, you, you're working in your passion, I hope. But what is, you know, if someone is looking for their passion and if someone is striving for their passion and they keep getting hit down, hit down, hit down, what's your advice for someone who really is passionate but they just feel like, oh, I'm not getting there? What, what, what can you say to them? You know, I just had this, a, a similar conversation. Um, and for me, Persistence is such a big key, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll share a story with you. I'll try to try to make it not a, not a long story. But when I was 14 years old, my dad bought me my first electric guitar. Wow. Right. And we couldn't really, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We couldn't afford to spend a lot. So we kind of went to buy a Stratocaster or a Telecaster. Right. And when I got there, I was playing all these different guitars. And the owner of the shop kind of saw that my dad was going to spend all this, you know, he was going to, he was going to buy something. Yeah. So he decided to bring out this one more guitar out, which was a Gibson Les Paul. Wow. Okay. And he came out with it and he opened up this case and it had this plush hot pink velvet lining, you know, like the seventies. And I was like, the first thing I saw was that it was the guitar that Carlos Santana and Jimmy Page played. Right. So be believe it or not, I had hair similar to Jimmy Page at the time. I had a big, <laughs> you know, afro going on with yeah. my hair, very curly. And um, my dad saw my eyes light up and he took me aside and had this conversation with me. And he made me promise. He said, you know, I'll buy you this guitar. We can't afford it. Your mother's going to kill me. But, you know, if you promise that you're going to stick with music, then I will buy you this, you know, I'll buy you this guitar. So at 14, you know, of course I'm like, sure, I promise, you know, I, you know, I wanted the guitar, but I didn't realize in that moment that I was creating a rite of passage in that promise mm -hmm. because I had anchored in something really important there. So my dad buys me the guitar. I, you know, I'm writing songs with the guitar. I'm playing guitar, I, you know, Years later, I, you know, become, I become a producer. And in the midst of all that, you know, I would see that guitar, Lisa, every day. Wow. And I would look at that guitar and I would see the name Les Paul, you know, on the, you know, on the neck of that guitar. And it began to become a symbol of my dad's belief in me and the promise I had made. So no matter how hard things were in my life, and that guitar would have brought a lot of money. And I, I would look mm -hmm. at it and see like the dollar signs and like, wow, this could pay for three months rent in New York, you know? Yeah. And, but I always remember that promise that I made my dad. And literally 30 years later, okay, from the, the time my dad bought me the guitar and it was almost to the date, you know, cause I looked at it yeah. and remember, I, I looked up when my dad bought that guitar. I was invited to participate on an album with Les Paul. Oh, wow. Okay, the guy's name who was on that guitar. And we had been going to, uh, me and another producer had been going to see Les Paul, you know, for, for a few years and asking him, let us produce this album with you. We had this whole concept. And he wasn't really open to it. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, there were many synchronicities that aligned 
and we ended up um, doing the album. And from the time that he said, okay, I'm on board, it only took a year to create the whole album. Wow. And the album, the, the piece that I co-produced ended up winning a Grammy for best rock instrumental. So <laughs> I'm sharing this story with you because there were so many moments within that 30 year period. I, I can't even count them, mm -hmm. you know, that I could have quit. Yeah. You know, there were so many times, Lisa, that I, you know, rolled up my change, quarters, dimes, and, you know, it's just so I could keep doing what I loved. And, you know, I would go out and buy chicken and baked potatoes, <laughs> you know, yeah. with that. And, you know, and then things started happening and unfolding and my joy ended up bringing in, you know, abundance with it because I kept with it. But had I stopped and, you know, in that 30 year period, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. And how many people quit one minute before the miracle? Absolutely. One minute before, you know, we can quit before the miracle. So that long-winded story is to tell people not to quit, you know, to keep going, keep persisting. Even if you have to take on another job, you know, keep nurturing your, your dreams yeah. and what brings you that love, even if it ends up unfolding in a different way. And you have to feed it in a different way and it can't be full-time initially. Mm -hmm. Keep feeding it. Um, create a team of people around you. You know, create your spiritual team of people who support what you do on your path, you know, on this, on this earth who you walk with and also create your spiritual team beyond you. You know, yeah. who would be your ultimate team? You know, part of my team now is my mother and father who are past. You know, like I know that they're guiding me from the other side. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure you see this all the time. All the time. You know, in your work, you know, people's spiritual team coming through and saying, yeah. don't, you know, don't give up. You know, yeah. we're here with you. That's so it. So create your, create your earth team, create your spiritual team, and just keep walking, you know, that path. And like you said, I love that thing with Beyonce. You know, let it unfold and let your, cre let your creations move beyond what they think, what you think they are. And I'm throw that was like great information for Diane Warren. Yeah, I know. You know right? It's like, it's like let it let it unfold because yeah. even the most successful people sometimes we want to control what that looks like. Yeah, she was so and, passionate about that piece, and I, I she's like, what she wants to change this. I said, let her do it, and she's like, oh, and and you know, it was it was amazing. It was it was one of those experiences and. The fact I got to listen to it while Beyonce was in the studio on wow. an old flip phone that she just got through or whatever it was, but we could actually hear it. She said, what do you think? And I was like, wow. I mean, it was, it was a remarkable experience. It really was. Um, well, I'll say too, uh, for, for your listeners who don't know who Diane Warren is. Oh, yeah. Because we're talking about persistence and not giving up on your yeah. dream. That she came into this conversation for a reason, but... I teach a songwriting class and most of the students there do not know who Diane Warren is. So I give them that as their homework. I say, I want you to look up who Diane Warren is yeah. and see the hundreds, I'm saying hundreds of hit songs that she has. But her story is amazing because she would wait outside of recording studios to give the artists yep. her songs on cassette tapes. Yep just so they would listen to it. Yeah. And, you know, over her 30 or 40 year period of writing songs, she's one of the most successful and affluent um, songwriters out there. Yeah. So Incredible. again, don't, you know, don't give up. Yeah. In and you know, what was funny is I, I didn't know who she was. And, and, you know, a friend of mine introduced me to her and um, she said, oh, this is Diane. We got talking. She found out what I did. She, you know, I'm in LA. I mean, everybody's either a producer or a songwriter. They do something. <laughs> and so, of course, I didn't have any understanding. And um, she dropped the name of one of her songs. And I went, I'm sorry. And very unassuming, very lovely woman. 
and I, I just could not believe I was standing next to this legend. I mean, yes. that's, legend is the word that I have to give her. <laughs> Absolutely. So listen, I mean, music is very subjective. Not everybody's going to like what you do. Not everybody's going to love what you do. You said something about having your team. A lot of people will have people on this earth not just music, but in any in in their pathway, what somewhere where someone is going, they may not find that people are supporting them. And so, you know, you and I are both married, not together, but we have our own <laughs> spouses. And so I know that Chris doesn't always believe what I'm doing, or he believes it, but he's he's like Lisa, you're a little bit crazy with that. I'm sure your wife has moments where she's like Barry, really. You know, we all have those moments. What can you say to someone where their team don't not always support them or don't always understand them? Well, I think it's important, you know, to really, to watch the energy of people around you. Mm -hmm. And also in the, when you're in the creative process, especially, I think of it almost like, um, you know, like a pregnancy. You know, when, when you're birthing something creative, sometimes initially you don't reach out to your team, mm -hmm. you know, and, and share the energy with it because it's still not grounded in. You know, it's like those first 12 weeks when, when a woman is pregnant, you know, it's very, it's more fragile. And a lot of people don't tell their friends, you know, or their family uh, that they're pregnant until that first 10 to 12 weeks is, is through and they know that the, that the, the, the baby is there, right? And it's safe. And I think of it the same way with our creations. You know, so for those first period of time where you're not sure of things and you're still looking for your footing, you know, this is where those divine collaborations are between you and God. And until you feel like the energies, like you've moved through it, and all your flow has come through, like let the energy come fully through where you feel you don't have any more ideas with it, right? Yeah. And then work through those energies and kind of ground them in until you feel that this is, this is what I want to share. Because yeah. a lot of times when the energy is not complete and we share an idea, we're seeing it and feeling it in, in ourselves, but people aren't fully getting it when we explain it. Mm -hmm. And that's when it's like a balloon that people start to puncture, you know, the energy and it has a, gets a slow leak in it, right? Well, I don't know about that. Someone else did something just like that or, hmm, um, you know, I think you need to work through that idea a little bit more. Like all of these things, you know, they kind of, they leak that energy between us and that divine spiritual connection that we were bringing through and it's before it's time. Yeah. You know, so before you share something and want that support, you have to find the support first where you feel grounded in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's really important. And also, you know, if you're not getting that support from someone in your team and that's ongoing, you know, um, sometimes people don't even know that they're jealous or envious or, you know, things that, that come into that field. And so you have to kind of look at it and, and say, is this, a, is this a characteristic that this person consistently brings in? Or is it just this one time? You know, again, does, this, and does their energy make me feel expansive or do I feel contracted? Mm -hmm. And again, you're constantly, it's a, it's a sense of awareness. Yeah. And that's when we, you know, really are kind of notching ourselves up on our spiritual path. It's not like we're, you know, we're, we're gurus or we're masters, but the more awareness that you bring into your situations, the more you bring your vibration up. Yeah. And it's not that we don't experience our own stuff and get triggered. We constantly do. I'm sure the Dalai Lama gets triggered. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Absolutely. You know, so by the way, he just came out with a new album. Like oh, Dalai really? Uh, yes. So. Wow. Of course you would know that. Of course you yeah. would. <laughs> so I've, I've got two, two final questions. Um, obviously, a lot of people who are watching this will be probably going through some form of grief, whether it's they've lost someone or they're going through a transitional time, which has created grief. 
what are your what's your advice with regards to music everyone can relate to it uh to help them through that moment of grief great great question i love your questions you have great questions ah oh, thanks um i think that you know looking at that person's life if if, if the grief is due to someone that we've lost a lot of times during the process of their passing, if it's someone close to us, we have to take on other roles that don't mm. always allow us to process our grief. Yes. And I know when my mom passed, you know, I, my dad was already gone. I had to kind of step into the role of kind of being the, um, the masculine energy and the male figure in the family. And I had to take on a lot of holding that space for the family. And I didn't get a, a, a lot of opportunity to move through my own grief. Mm. And, you know, knowing this and knowing that I was in that capacity, um, you know, a few months later when my mom was gone and all the family things were taken care of, I really wanted to move the grief and I wanted to do it in a way that was going to be a connection to my mom on the other side as well. So I said, wow, how can I honor my mom and create ceremony for her, you know, and, and connect with her and move through some of this grief. And music was the key, you know, to doing that. You know, one of my, my mother was really, really instrumental in my musical path, although she wouldn't have considered herself a musician. My mom taught me to play yellow bird on the piano, you know, with her fingers going over mine. When I was like three or four years old, you know, my mom was always a supporter who's like, oh, I, I love that song you know, when I was doing it. Right. And my mom also, um, you know, said that she wanted a specific piece of music used when she was when she was buried. Chopin's Nocturne um, 9 in E flat. Wow. In E flat. So I said, wow, these are like really these are really great things to honor her with. So mm -hmm. I created a playlist of Harry Belafonte's Yellow Bird, which was the first song she taught me. Mm -hmm. um, I put some of my music that I knew that my mom loved, you know, from um, an angel CD I created. There's a song called One White Feather that mm -hmm. I wrote that my mom really loved. And then I put Chopin's Nocturne in E flat on there. And those three songs really just created this beautiful rite of passage that allowed me to connect with my mom mm. and really feel her energy to know that she's not gone, right? It's just really connecting with her and allowing me to move through the grief. And I cried through it and I released a lot of energy and I thanked her and um, it really allowed me to move through that grief and enhance our connection in a different way. So I say for people who are experiencing grief, whether it's um, a loved one passing or, or a relationship that's no longer there, you know, what, what playlist could you create that would honor that relationship? Or, you know, if it's a breakup that, you know, is not something that, you know, necessarily was honoring to you, mm -hmm. what song can allow you to release some anger, you know, within that grief? It doesn't always have, yeah, right? it doesn't always have to be, a, you know, it's about moving energy because anytime you move that energy, you're releasing a block. And when you release a block, it's a healing. Right. That's amazing. That's beautiful about you, mom. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being yeah. there, open enough to share. So what are your words of wisdom right now for those who, who need help, who need help, who are looking for something? What and your words of wisdom that can just help them get through this moment. My, my words of wisdom were to be, would be to look at music in a different way. Mm. Um, most of us think of, of music as something that happens to us. But I think of music as something that happens in us. Right. It's going, going on in our bodies. We have a symphony of sound you know, in our heartbeat, in our breath, in our sigh outward, you know, when we're <sighs> releasing energy, you know, we have these soul sounds. So my words of wisdom are to connect more 
with the music within you. You know, place your hands on your heart during your day. Listen to your own heartbeat. Listen to your breath. Breathe into your heart. And release energy, you know, through your heart. Mm -hmm. And the more that you do this, the more you connect with your heart and the sounds within you, the more you begin to have conversations with your heart. And, you know, music's a language and sound is a language. And the more you talk to your heart, the more you can listen back and begin to have these conversations where you're tapping into your intuition, into your guidance. So utilize music and become your own sound alchemist, you know, to move energy utilizing sound in any of the ways that we talk to about, you know, throughout this. Yeah. Whether it's chanting or singing or just listening to music or tapping to music at 60 beats per minute, you know, know that music is going on within you. And when you love or like a piece of music, it's because it resonates with something that's already there. You know, it's already creating music within you. Yeah, and beautiful. so that would be my words of wisdom. Music is in you, not outside of you. That's it. Thank you, Barry, for being part of this. I really, really appreciate it so much. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me and creating the wonderful conversation and wanting to share this, you know, with your audience, with your tribe, you know, I think is so important. And the work that you share is just amazing in, in giving people tools and comfort, you know, on their path yeah. as well. Thank so you. thank you for all you've done. Uh, and you're welcome.